<coughs> okay, welcome to the last week of this advanced quantum algorithms course. And this whole week will be devoted to quantum machine learning. So, my plan is something like this. We'll start out with first a quick review of classical machine learning because uh, we have not demanded this as a prerequisite that you know anything about machine learning before this course. Um, so I'll give a very quick overview of that. And then we'll, later today we'll get started on discussing some uh, problems of quantum machine learning. And then the next two sessions will go more in, in deeper in some quantum machine learning algorithms. Um, my idea is that we'll do something like quantum support vector machine, uh, quantum principle component analysis next time, and then on Friday we'll discuss more quantum versions of neural networks. So maybe first I could say also that when people say quantum machine learning, we sometimes they mean uh, quantum computers being used for machine learning or they sometimes talk about machine learning, classical machine learning being applied to some quantum problem. So here we are, since this is a course about quantum algorithms, we, we are going to focus on quantum computers being used for machine learning tasks. <coughs> so to get us started, is it, there's someone who can define what machine learning is. Question. Yeah, maybe it's a good thing that he's not here, so you have to think <laughs> for yourselves. What do you think of when you think of machine learning? So, can you define machine learning? Yeah. And there was silence. <laughs> so then I tried to ask a simpler question. What, what do you think machine learning is? Or what do you associate with machine learning? A machine learning something? <laughs> well, it feels like a very wide thing. A machine is learning an algorithm to, to give an output from a certain input. Mimic human. Like human? Like mimic human brain. Okay. Mm. Maybe a computer or a machine performing a task that a, a human is usually doing. I would say rather a machine learning how to perform a task because you could program something to like this is how we solve this problem, but that's not machine learning, that's just programming. While I would say machine learning is when you program it to learn from some could be from pictures or from some recordings or whatever, but it's like the, the essential part is that it's learning from something. An algorithm that is like is developed by using training. By using what? Training data. Training data. Not to input data. So, so <coughs> I checked the other day. The definition on Wikipedia was that machine learning is the scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform a specific task without using explicit instructions, relying on patterns and inference instead. So, um, so like you said, you, you're not you haven't programmed something explicitly, but it's it's learning uh, how to do it 
have to do the task instead. Um, I like perhaps the definition I've seen. I don't know what the source is, but I've seen a definition that goes like this. Uh, machine learning um, studies algorithms a little broader than the machine learning method, but any, it's more like any algorithm that uh, performs better, not better, if you feed it more and more data. So this can be like learning from experience, you, you get more training data that you can train on, and then you get better at doing whatever task you So, yeah, as you can tell, there is no, well, no one definition of, of machine learning. And my, my feeling is that now that machine learning is such a hot topic, I mean, we have quantum computing and machine learning are both hot topics. So people are now, of course, uh, think about also what happens when you combine it with quantum machine learning. Do you, got, do you get something great or do you get something overhyped? <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll try to, to figure out that. But um, where was I going with that? Yes, so now that machine learning is um, so prevalent, I think there is a tendency to call things machine learning that would not have been called machine learning five or ten years ago that you might have called curve fitting or uh, something else, but now everyone calls it machine learning. <laughs> um, okay. So, when, when you talk about machine learning, there are a number of different types of learning, and there are perhaps three main classes that are good to know what they mean. Supervised learning and supervised learning. Seems like that covers, <coughs> covers everything. Yeah, you can say so. Unsupervised, supervised. Then we we'll also talk about reinforcement learning. Sometimes people have that as a separate category. So. Can you tell me what unsupervised learning is? Okay. Mm, the one without training data. Well, you need some data to work with. Oh, without labels. Without labels, yeah, yeah. yes. So, if you're doing unsupervised learning, uh, you, you're you working with data that you haven't labeled in any way. No one has looked at it before or tried to sort it out before. It's, you get some unsorted data and the machine tries to find some structure in it, trying to find some pattern. So, to learn structure, some 
probability distribution in the data uh, given samples. You can talk about generating knowledge. So where What's some example of unsupervised learning? Where, where is this applied? Clustering? Clustering? Clustering, yes. So what does clustering mean? Um, it clusters all the data points that are similar properties. Yeah. So you, you find, it's a way to find a pattern in data, right? You have a lot of data points and you say, oh, maybe I can put these in different groups. Um, this group of points are similar in some way. This group is similar in some way. Um, I would say... Data mining is another buzzword these days. This this could be one thing. So yeah, really, you have some unlabeled data, and you're trying to find some some patterns or structure. So that could be unsupervised learning. Okay, then we have supervised learning. Here is a million pictures of cats. Yes. Learn what a cat is. Something like that. Yeah, or it's more like here are a million pictures that, of cats, and uh, we showed that to you, and then here's a new picture. Is this a cat? So here you learn some structure. in what labels should should be assigned to what data uh, from some training set you're giving some data which has some labels attached to it that humans already put there and then from that the algorithm infers some rules for how to take new data uh, and assign that labels so you can say this is to instead of generating knowledge this is generalizing knowledge So, 
I'll give you some examples and um, from that we, we can infer general features so it helps us identify new features of cats or dogs or whatever. So what is this used for? Well, for example, classification tasks. And perhaps the most well-known example is exactly recognizing what is depicted in different images. Okay. This does not want to stay up. Okay, then we have reinforcement values. It's that you give, you train by giving rewards, yes. It does not have to be at every step. Mm -hmm. It can actually be quite uh, rare rewards. Maybe you sort of try to explore some labyrinth and you only get the reward at the end if you explore mm -hmm. But yes, uh, it's training by uh, rewards, learning from rewards. Learning from possibly rare So usually you have some agent, the program, it can act on some environment. Um, typical example of game gameplay. Um, so you can take some action and then you observe the results of that action. Maybe you get the reward, maybe you win the game at the end. And based on that, those observations on the agent then updates its algorithm for choosing which actions to take. So, examples are gameplay, so Google's DeepMind have made these products like that achieved superhuman performance in board games like Go and Chess and now computer games like Atari games and more recently StarCraft. What, what type of game is StarCraft? Is it? It's a real-time strategy game. Oh. So it's Unlike Go and Chess, which are perfect information games where you see yeah. the whole board and they are also turn based, you take do yeah, one yeah. turn at time. In StarCraft, it's like, yeah, like many other real time strategy games, it's uh, two players, you don't have full vision of the map, you don't know what your opponent is doing, um, and it's not turn based, you have to take actions. In real time. So I think that they uh, 
limited the number of actions that the computer program was allowed to take at per second ah, yeah, or so. So it wouldn't be an unfair advantage. Okay, so. And yes. a question about the reinforcement learning. If yes. we just regard the time is another dimension, so after several times, then we give a reward, which means we label this, this whole data, this whole process as a good one, then it's somehow kind of a supervised learning with just a label good or wrong. Yeah, it's supervised in the way that yeah, you could say it's a supervisor that gives this reward, not if you see good behavior. Uh, but it's not, it's not pre-labeled data. The agent generates the data itself by its actions. The, the agent here it, it chooses actions to take in the game, and things develop from there. So there's no pre-labeled data. Okay, so there are many things that can be machine learning. Um, one of the most common ways to actually implement machine learning uh, is to use a neural network. So I thought I'd show some basics for that. Usually a neuron, it has several inputs, let's call them x1, x2 and so on, x, j, and then these inputs are combined by this neuron with some weights. So each input is weighted with some weight W. And then this weighted sum is um, used as an input for some nonlinear function here. And then we finally end up with an output. We have inputs, weights, outputs, and also sometimes we have separate input that's called a bias. So 
so this output y is a function of the weighted sum and then to that weighted sum you add perhaps some bias um, is a non-linear function um, it can be for example a step function or uh, some more uh, tanj or sigmoid function usually something like this or uh, real rectifying linear unit So these uh, x's here, the inputs, are usually then outputs from some previous neurons. Um, these weights and this bias uh, are the parameters of your neural network that you can update when you, when you train this network. I have a question. Yes. Is the output from the neuron single valued or is y here a vector? Um, usually it's a scalar. Um, but there are uh, networks where you uh, take the output as a vector. Okay, so you can have y1, y2. Yeah, so but you, for, uh, I think you can think of it as a scalar. Okay. Uh, that's, that's what you do. And I think if you wanted to form a vector, probably you could have multiple neurons and mm -hmm. their combined output could be a vector. So, perhaps most common neural network or that you might have seen the most is some sort of feed-forward neural network. And there you have some neurons to the left. not important exactly how I draw the lines here, <laughs> so you don't have to explain it exactly. Um, but usually we'll have something like this, you have here on left some input layer, This is where you feed in the data. So uh, this is just some scalar uh, values. X. They, there is no there is no preprocessing of this nonlinear function. It's just this output from this input goes to the next layer where the processing stops. And then you have at the end here some output layer. And you read out what these neurons spit out at the end, and that's the answer. It can be, for example, if we think about this image classification task, is it a cat or a dog? Uh, in image, it could be that 
um, this is the neural network sense cats, this is a dog. So if this is one, it means it's a cat, and that's zero now. Or if this is one and that is zero, then it's a dog. Or, or, or both are one. Yeah, then the, the network is confused. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some rule and or say like, some cutoff value for when you think it's, it's certain. Now, here in the middle, these layers between the input and output are called hidden layers. And that's where the processing then happens. So you have all the parameters, you have weights on all these connections, there are biases for each of these neurons in the hidden layers. And together, this network implements some complicated function uh, from input to output. Why is it that then that neural networks are so uh, useful? Well, there is um, a result already from 1989 saying something about the power of this network. How, what functions can it represent? Sibenko, he said that any arbitrary smooth function with vector input And vector output I mean here we get out uh, some two-dimensional answer and we put in some three-dimensional uh, vector um, can be approximated As well as you desire um, by a feed forward and then with just a single hidden layer. This assumes that the, the, this activation function is, called, um, is sometimes called activation function. Uh, it's, uh, it has to be nonlinear for this to hold. Um, sigmoid, right? Um, sigmoid, for example. Yeah, I thought his proof was. Uh, his proof may have been for sigmoid, I'm not sure. Um, so, this is quite astonishing, actually, I think. Mm. 
But so what he says is that you have, he doesn't say how many neurons you need to have in this hidden layer. But he says if, if you put enough neurons there in the hidden layer, then you're able to really approximate any smooth function from Rn to Rn. But it's like recognizing the picture, is that a smooth function? Like there's a very discrete line, is it a cap or not? Yeah. I, that, mm, I don't think it has to be a okay. smooth function. Uh, like uh, the, the image recognition, I, I can imagine that it's sometimes not a smooth function. Um, This just says that you're sure to make, be able to do it for a smooth function. But it, it doesn't say it won't work for sure uh, if it's not smooth. But is cat and dog a smooth function? Because you're just saying, like, I don't know, I feel like because you can, you're giving like some probability of it being a cat versus being a dog. So it's like a, some, some zero to one. But like the output, like I, I input a picture, I will always get yes or no to my question, yeah, right? Maybe you don't I will not get like 50% cat. I think but what he means is that before you get yes and no, it's actually a, maybe a range from 0 to 1. And no, you don't, I think you... Does to get the final Normally it doesn't just say yes or no, right? Yeah. It will say like... Yeah, it does. 99. It says 0 0.9 here. Or yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess depending which activation function you use. Yeah, yeah, but then the fa but that's kind of like... Like if I use a, a, a step function in the final layer... Yeah, but it's still yeah. smooth because it could be exactly on 0 0.5 and then the step function says, okay, we're on... Undefined or... Oh, oh, sorry, okay, well it depends how... If your, if your step function is like that, yeah. <laughs> then I guess, yeah, but... Yeah, so this gives a hint that neural networks can be very powerful. Um, however, as I said, it doesn't say how many neurons you need in that hidden layer. And if you look at neural networks that are being used today, they are usually not just a single hidden layer. They are rather many hidden layers, so they are what we call deep uh, networks. Does deep mean like more than one, more than ten, more than hundred? I don't like, think there is a certain. No, but number. like, what, what, you know, what, like the general rule of thumb is for calling the deep. I have heard the definition of deep is when you have hidden layers, basically. When it's not direct input to output. From my girlfriend who took a course in ANN. Just one hidden layer? Yeah, like if you have hidden layers. And that's what she thought was funny about it, like, how is that deep? That is just one layer. But, but anyways, that's what she told me was the definition from the course in okay. artificial neural networks. Uh, from my understanding, it has to be more than one. <laughs> All right. So two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but basically, um, there, there was some nice work, for example, by Max Tegmark, right now, Swedish physicist at MIT. Um, a few years ago looked at this like okay how many how many neurons do you actually need to represent some simple function some like multiplication and then uh, calculated that for the case of a single hidden layer and then calculated it also for the case of several hidden layers and it turned out that you could do it with much fewer neurons if you could if you had several layers Hmm. But, the, but the, yeah. the point is kind of like that the, you could, in theory, do it with yeah. one, but it, maybe it would take a billion neurons. Well. Exactly, um, yeah. It, the scaling was much, was much better yeah. uh, if you put more layers there instead. And that's what sort of seemed to come out in fact. This is, this, so this theorem or this, this result is more uh, reassurance that uh, of the potential of neural networks, then how to actually implement it best is another thing. And 
deep networks seem to work well. <laughs> but there's lots of heuristics in this field and sort of gain from practical experience but not backed up by rigorous theory yet. Okay, so now we have our say deep network lots of connections here and we have weights and biases for all these neurons and connections and now we want to train this network to perform some task for example to classify cancer mode. So how do we train this? I, I don't have the time to explain that in detail but i try to give just a brief idea Actually, that's a good time for a break, so we'll uh, train our neural networks after the break. Uh, let's meet at quarter past two. Shall we maybe stop recording? Uh, yes, please.